You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Well, hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Writing Black. As always, I am your host, Maisha Kai of The Griot. And this week we have a very, very special guest who a lot of you will recognize, maybe not as much for her writing, but for her incredible presence, her incredible performance. But don't sleep, because she's written like seven books, <laughs> eight now, actually. <laughs> and we're here to talk to um, the incredible, uh, the multi-talented Misty Copeland is here with us today to talk about her latest book, Wind at My Back. Um, this is, a, as I was saying to Misty right before we uh, started taping, very special book. I'm going to let her tell you why <laughs> that is. But, you know, those of you who are unfamiliar with Misty's story, you know, she is the first black woman to be a principal dancer for the American Ballet Theater, um, among many other accolades. And it has been an incredible presence, I think an incredible um, uh, inspiration to an entire generation, uh, several generations now probably of, of young dancers coming up and as well as her peers. And we're just so excited to have you here today, Misty. Welcome. Thank you. I am so, so, so excited. <laughs> no, this is super cool. This is super cool for me too, because I, I, you know, I love ballet. I have since I was a little kid, I, I was there. You can't see it. I almost put it behind me. There's a picture here in this studio uh, that is also my office of me at age four in a tutu, you know, oh, doing I my version know. of a low plie. I should have put it out for, the, <laughs> for this interview. <laughs> but I say that to say that, you know, um, what you represent to uh, so many of us, uh, you know, and I know that that's a huge mantle to carry when you're just following your passion, right? Um, has been tremendous. And you, I think, have not only danced with such grace, but picked it up with such grace. And this book in particular, um, I, the special is the word I keep using, but this is a book, not just about it's, it's, I mean, it almost reads like it's a, it's another part of your memoir. You've already written yeah. a memoir, but this is like kind of a new chapter, <laughs> you know, to your ongoing, uh, your ongoing saga, but also, um, interwoven with this huge tribute to your mentor, Raven uh, Wilkinson. Uh, Wilkinson? Wilkerson? I'm yeah, Wilkinson. Blank you. Yeah. Wilkinson. I was like, how am I blanking on that? Uh, yeah. Who is, I, I, I hate using this term, but an unsung black mm -hmm. ballerina from whom uh, you uh, not just saw so much of yourself mirrored, but also um, gleaned so much wisdom from. So how did this project come about for you? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's just, it's, it always is so touching and kind of goes to like the, the root and the, the power of dance. Whenever I hear stories, like you just shared about being four years old <laughs> in the tutu wanting to dance, like there, there are so many amazing people that I meet through, you know, in all walks of uh, areas of my life that, have been connected to dance in some way at some point in their life and ballet in particular. And it's mm -hmm. always uh, so comforting to me, uh, just the power of it. But then it's also disappointing to know that, you know, so many don't follow that path yeah. because they don't have representation because they don't have access or, uh, you know, someone that's there to support them and guide them. And, um, you know, I was fortunate to have been discovered, um, at my boys and girls club and have, have a small circle. It was very supportive around me. Not like the, the typical story of a black girl who mm -hmm. is often in a studio where she's the only one and is told she's not right. She should go into another genre, et cetera. Et cetera. Throughout my career, like so many other Black dancers, people have wanted to push me toward modern dance, which is considered freer, wilder, and therefore more suitable to someone of my heritage. Yet my dream was ballet from my first class at 13, wearing gym shorts on a basketball court at the Boys and Girls Club of San Pedro. So um, it's it's just so meaningful to hear these stories. and then And then to be able to be in a place where I can share the stories of so many black women who 
weren't given the opportunities that I was given and mm -hmm. didn't get a chance to even reach the level that I'm at. And Raven Wilkinson, um, you know, when I learned of her story, I was already a professional dancer um, and had gotten to a place where I felt like what's what's next for me. I was a soloist and I didn't know that I could ever even reach that that point of being a principal dancer and just seeing Raven's story and learning that not a lot has changed from the 1950s yeah. um, and that it was my responsibility to push through and, and, you know, she's passed me the torch and to go all the way. And that, you know, there's so many black women who have done this and I, and I feel again, it's my responsibility to t tell their stories. So um, like you said, it's like a continuation from my memoir. It's these, the next stages in my life and, and how, you know, Raven influenced me and impacted me and the, the, the importance of intergenerational relationships and the importance of mentorship. And, um, I truly don't believe I would be a principal dancer had I not, uh, found Raven's story and then found out she lived a block away from me. And that was the wild part. <laughs> it's like so wild I to me. I love it, that. It felt like such kismet. And, and you, you know, you just love to read those moments. It was very warming to the yeah. heart to read that. Um, yeah. Gosh, you know, and I, I, one of the things that really struck me too, yes, this, the way that you even found her, you know, this like doing this thing that a lot of us do, you know, watching the documentary, you know, on something we're interested in. Like, you know, for me, I'm like, maybe I'm, maybe it's an Ella Fitzgerald documentary. Maybe it's Toni right. Morrison, you know? Um, and, and you watching this documentary, finding this woman looking for her. And I, I, I remember you writing something like, you know, heartbreakingly, she didn't have a Wikipedia page. Right. I turned to the only tool I had Google heartbreakingly this pioneering ballerina didn't have a wikipedia page however i did find interviews she'd given i read them all and watched the ones available on youtube but when i see in the context you say that fairly early on in the book but in the context of the book as a whole i couldn't help but get the impression that you were doing the thing that you felt should have been done which is to tell <laughs> her story alongside your own like as much as this is a story um, about your own trajectory it is so very much a story about hers as well, which yeah. is, you know, um, as, as we all know, you know, like we're not monolithic. It's very different from yours. You know, your, your own story being well documented in terms of being raised by a single mom with siblings mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> having a very like roller coaster of a childhood in terms yeah. of what that looked like in terms of stability, um, not of love, but of just access. Right. right. Where is she? You know, grew up in this very, you know, middle class, upper middle class for black people, yes. I think, in the 50s family, you know, was going to Columbia while she was also pursuing this career as a ballerina. Um, I guess what what struck me about that, it was your desire to tell her story, because yeah. um, I don't know that we always do that because it's not I mean, it, it's it's just so it, it's. <laughs> the weaving of this and we have to shout out Susan Faleshill who you yes. co-wrote this with who's yes. an incredible author and incredible presence in her own and right. been a mentor of mine yes I love that I love that so yeah and we're gonna get into mentorship too yeah. I want to talk about that um but was that your aim was your, was this basically your kind of um like when you were crafting how you were going to tell this story and I'm sure you know everybody wants to know more about you all the time but when you're crafting this, was there this deliberate, like, no, it has to be told like this. Like we have to weave this thing. We have to like, you know, do these parallel lives kind of thing. Cause yes. that was such a striking format. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I wanted to tell Raven's story, mm. but we wanted to do it in a way that sh really could show the power of uh, her, her presence, the power mm -hmm. of representation, the power of of mentorship, so that it wasn't just a straightforward, um, you know, uh, biography or autobiography of of, of Ravens. Um, that I think that her power is how she touched people. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of of sharing her story, the ups and downs, but but how much she meant to so many people, and how many more people need to know her story. Reflecting on Raven's remarkable journey and undefeatable faith and optimism reminded me that the source of power and dignity that Black Americans have cultivated over 400 years is stronger than any racist theory. 
Um, but I love that you that you pointed out, you know, the fact that it's important, you know, for us, especially in the in, in the ballet world and in this community, this very white world, to show that we are not a monolith and to mm -hmm. show that we don't all come from my experience. We don't all come from a single parent home with no money and no opportunity like Raven grew up in New York City in, in this rich arts environment, you know, seeing the ballet from a young age, she grew up in the theater and, mm -hmm. and, and that's usually what's stopping, you know, what that's usually the excuse that you're not a part of it from early enough. So it's harder for us to take you in. A lot of black dancers will have a later start. They don't grow up in it. And we can't keep telling that story because it's not everyone's story. And so, I, you know, it was important for, for you know, Susan and I coming up with the, the idea of, of our paralleled stories and then how they come together and, and the beautiful relationship that that blossomed, you know, up until, you know, her, her passing. And just the fact that she got to see and witness me becoming a principal dancer just, you know, means the world to me that, um, you know, it was like a gift I could give her and to have her walk on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House at Lincoln Center, um, which is not something that they let happen. It's so crazy how it's still this, you know, this old traditional art form where uh, men that work in the theater are the only ones that can come on stage and bring the ballerina flowers. Mm. And me and my manager, Gilda, fought to have this black ballerina who never had the opportunity to dance on that stage come and present me flowers at my first Swan Lake um, at the Metropolitan Opera House. You know, I so first of all, I'm tearing up at that story. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but we're going to be back with more Writing Black and the incredible Misty Copeland. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Griot mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. Okay, we are back with more Writing Black and Misty Copeland, who is uh, talking about the wind at my back, <laughs> her uh, tribute to her mentor, uh, Raven Wilkinson, ballerina Raven Wilkinson, who, if you don't know her, there, you know, it's, it's that's not uncommon, unfortunately. Uh, she is one of those incredible talents, groundbreakers, trailblazers, whose uh, narrative until now had largely gone untold. Um, but this is a, such a powerful narrative of mentorship. And you mentioned that earlier. And it's striking because, of course, you know, you're speaking about this in a very specific context of the ballet world. But we see this throughout industry is that black women in particular are the least likely to, to get mentorship. Um, we don't have that tip, we don't typically get that kind of support, whether we're in the corporate world or creative fields. We, you know, and 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 some will attribute that to the fact that there's just not enough of us, um, you know. But others, like yourself, when you're entering these fields where you're the first or you're the only, like who is there to give you this not just uh, relatable experience, but relationship and this guidance? Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit more about like mentorship? I mean, cause I know you're, you are now a mentor as well. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and what that's meant in your life. I mean, you know, and, and even co-authoring yeah. this book with a mentor. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been, um, my, my biggest strength throughout, throughout my career has been having incredible mentors and specifically mm -hmm. black women. Um, and, you know, I, I talk a lot about, uh, you know, that, I think young people, you have to be in a place where you're open to receiving guidance mm. and advice. Um, I think to really, to really uh, be able to see what's out there. And 
um, I would say Susan Faleshill, who who co-wrote the book with me, was one of my first mentors. Um, when I well, when I moved to New York City, Victoria Rowell, who's an actress, yeah. black actress, she was probably like the first like mentor uh, in my life as a professional uh, ballerina. She danced with ABT mm-hmm. Studio Company um, in the eighties, and um, and you know. Her story is the same as so many yeah, black women. I think women. a lot of people know that she was a dancer. I just ran across a picture of her the other day and people were talking about yeah. how she was somebody who, like you, could have gone all the way because she was exactly. that talented. Yeah. And she made it into ABT's junior company and danced with a lot of ballerinas that went on to become principal dancers. And she didn't get that opportunity, so she went into acting. But um, she's someone that was in my life from an early age. And uh, it makes all the difference when you have someone who looks at you in your eyes, who uh, you can see yourself through who who talks to you like like an equal. Um, so I understand the power of having that in, in in one's life. And I've had so many incredible women that have come into my life that have been that for me. So, you know, when I when I first saw Raven on the screen, um, it hit me in a different way than any of and the, any of the other mentors that I've had in my life. And, and I think it's because she had gone as far as she could in her professional career. And so I I really felt like I was walking in her path. Um, And then her career was cut short in America because she was dancing with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, which was the the company, um, you know, that came from Europe and really was like the first American ballet company. And she was the first and only black woman to dance there. She became a soloist and then they spent most of their time touring through the South in America. So uh, the KKK was threatening her life and it mm-hmm. was just causing such a big, big, a lot of trouble for the whole company. So mm-hmm. she ended up leaving um, and moving to Europe, which a lot of black dancers, even to this day, do yeah. um, to find more work. Um, but just learning of her story and understanding uh, that I feel like it's, she's giving me an understanding of my purpose in a much bigger way than I had before. Um, and it, it's just, I understand the power of representation and what it means for me to be open and give my, you know, experiences to younger people that are coming up. And, um, you know, with my last book, Black Ballerinas, like it was important for me to not just tell the stories of black women who have come before me, but those that are my peers that are that are going to continue on after I'm retired um, that it's important for us to support one another because there's this beautiful through line in all of our stories. Um, I love that. And I want to talk a little bit more about storytelling. Uh, and we will in just a moment when we're back with more Writing Black. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Grio Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. We are back with Writing Black and Misty Copeland. And you were just talking about telling the stories of all these incredible um, peers and predecessors. Um, I want to talk about storytelling in general, because, again, you know, it's like when you say the name Misty Copeland, obviously everybody just envisions you, you know, twirling around, you know, doing pirouettes on stage or dancing next to Prince or, you know, um, but you have become pr- quite a prolific writer in this same period of time, which, you know, I I have to applaud you because I think like that's one of those seizing you know and not everybody seizes that opportunity to to tell stories uh especially if that's not their you know first medium um but i want to talk about you know because this is a podcast about writing while black writing black stories writing about black identity etc cetera, etc cetera, or just the inherent blackness that 
<laughs> you know, seeps into all of our writing. Um, I, I, I want to talk about storytelling with you in particular, because I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking about writing as a medium, but you've been telling stories this whole time. I mean, every time you step on the stage, you're telling a story. So in, in finding your voice as a writer, what were some of the, I guess, what were some parallels or, or, or strengths that you, you found, <laughs> you know, that you didn't, you didn't even know you had because you were already telling stories the whole time. Yeah. You know, writing has been, it was probably one of my earliest outlets before ballet. Ah, um, okay. Yeah. I was such a shy and introverted child. Um, you know, being the fourth of six children, just coming from the, the, the environments, the circumstances that I grew up in that really didn't nurture me um, to be, you know, kind of feel, feel secure enough to be open, um, mm. and communicative and writing in, in journals became my way of expression. And, you know, when I wrote my first, my memoir, um, almost 10 years ago, I think it was now, um, I had just stacks of journals that I was drawing from when I wrote my memoir that I could go back and look at, you know, what I was thinking and feeling and going through at 12 years old, 13 years old, which is really incredible. Um, but and then I found ballet and that became even more of, of, of a connection to how I needed to express myself. But they're not that different. Mm. Um you know, what, what we're doing as, as dancers is telling stories through our body, through the technique and language of dance, uh, with ballet, it's the tech, the technique of ballet in particular. Um, and they're, they're, they're kind of one in the same to me, you know, whether it's reading books and doing the research I have to do to become a character that I'm performing on stage. I feel like they're all so interwoven and, and connected. And I feel like with each book, um, I learn more about myself and kind of become more confident in, in who I am and who I want to be, um, which is like a really amazing privilege. That is, it's a privilege to hear too. Cause I, I think you, well, first of all, you hit on exactly what I, I think I was intuiting from, from not just your writing, but just from my own experience of watching you dance of watching ballet. I'm like, these are stories. Like all of this is storytelling. You know, I work at a site called the Grio, which literally means storyteller, you know? Um, so, you know, this, to me, this idea of, um, tradition and, and storytelling, I mean, it's kind of what we do. Um, but I want to get into a little bit more. Um, I'm going to take a quick break and we'll be back with more Misty Copeland. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Griot mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. All right. Uh, so, Misty, you were just talking about um, we were just talking about the parallels between ballet and the written word and storytelling and, and, and all these types of things. And, you know, it's so interesting. You know, one of the things one of the. I think one of the things that any any black person who happens to be talented or wants to participate into in the so-called fine arts runs into the, is this idea of belonging, right? Like mm -hmm. who belongs there? Who doesn't, what is the canon? Who's in the canon, you know? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, the field that you're in um, particularly, like, I would say far more than writing, you know, it is, it, you know, ballet is so, 
identify with a European aesthetic, a European, Mm -hmm. you know, the music, everything from the music to the bodies to the everything, right? Um, Which obviously you've been working really hard to shift. And I love very much that in this book, you challenge the idea, um, and I know you've done this before, but uh, both you and Raven challenge this idea that it is us who should adapt. It is us who should, you know, stop trying to integrate spaces that aren't supposedly for us, you know, mm-hmm. um, and maybe integrate isn't the right word, but you know, I had, I've just had a conversation not too long ago with, uh, the journalist Charlene Hunter Galt, who was the first black woman who, to integrate the university of Georgia. Right. You know, and you think to yourself, like, could she have been that successful going to a Spelman? Maybe like, that's not really the point. <laughs> you know, that's not actually the point. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about like, I guess, the concept of, you know, I guess as the, as the phrase goes, like when and where you enter to paraphrase that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause you have this amazing quote right at the beginning. I'm going to paraphrase this. Sorry to interrupt you. I I just, this struck out to me so much in your introduction, you said, and I'm going to, I hope I don't get this wrong, that when you're marginalized from the culture, you're marginalized from citizenship. And I just was like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's it's something that that I learned from Raven too. I mean, I had my own like intuitive, you know, uh, response and 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 feeling that like it's it's no one's place to tell me where I should dance, where Mm -hmm. I can succeed. Um, And Raven, you know, was so much about the fact that. Um, she's a black woman and she's never going to deny that, but she's American. And when people would ask her, you know, well, what are you? And she knew what they were looking for. She would never answer with, oh, I'm African-American or I'm this Mm -hmm. and that. She would say, I'm an American and look them dead in their eye. Like, yes, (laughs) which sounds like so, so strong and powerful, especially in that time when, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, black people, I think, often felt that they had to like shrink in order mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, not cause any uproar or pass, um, which you also, you know, kind pass. of address there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and she never did that, you know, and that was, you know, it's a big part of her story that within that company, they asked her to, and she, and, you know, she said, of course, I'm not going to, you know, cause, cause any uh, uproar, but I'm not going to pass. Um, and not that I've ever been asked to do anything like that, but, um, you know, it was important in, you know, for me to kind of stand my ground and say that my goal has always been American ballet theater and the importance for us to be in that space is so powerful and so important in order to really make progress. Um, and, but also the importance of a dance theater of Harlem or a, a Negro ballet, you know, and throughout throughout history, that the, these black companies that had to exist when mm-hmm. they were not, you know, there was an opportunity for black dancers in these uh, majority white companies. Um, and then, you know, being offered a position with the dance theater of Harlem, you know, back when I was, I don't know, 20 years old um, and being offered a soloist position and understanding what an honor that is. But I knew that that wasn't the place for me. I knew Mm -hmm. that I wanted to dance for ABT because of the repertoire, because I I grew up, you know, looking at these dancers and and that was what I felt my my position where I should be. Um, And also in order to really make real change in those spaces, I felt like I needed to be there, whether it was going to happen for me or not. My presence there was going to make an impact for so many black and brown people who were coming to see me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those stories are told in this book. (laughs) Yeah, no, they are. And I mean, as is, you know, you address really the tightrope of that, you know, the the inevitable. (sighs) The dichotomy of like both the importance of integrating a space and 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 acknowledging you know the challenges inherent in it, mm-hmm. whether that be or uh, not even the cha- <sighs> i mean you, like you talk about colorism in this book which you know i i can relate to that conversation mm-hmm. you know in terms of when we talk about access um that is yes on one hand earned but also granted <laughs> you know yeah. like who gets granted that access you know right. whether you're qualified or not right Colorism is very real within the Black community and beyond, and it certainly has played a role in both Raven's and my access and opportunity within ballet. But, of course, that does not exclude lighter-skinned Black people from discrimination or being considered other. Black dancers are not a monolith, 
And my feeling and hope are that the success of any of us can help open the door, if even only incrementally wider, for the success of us all. And I also think, you know, what what is both, um, I mean, as inspiring as you are, as inspiring as Raven is, the fact that, you know, you started this conversation saying that not much has changed in 50 years. And like, what does change look like for us? I mean, we're going through the same thing in politics. Not enough has changed in 50 years, yep. you know. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, uh, but we'll be right back with uh, more of the amazing Misty Copeland. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot Mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. And we're back with Misty Copeland and more Writing Black. We were just talking about how everything old <laughs> is new again, or maybe it just never left us in the first place. But, um, you know, when you're writing a book like this, when you're when you're looking at the kids walking into LaGuardia, as you recount in the book, when yeah. you are, you know, you're now a mother, you know, so that's and congratulations on that. And also congratulations on keeping it to yourself because like that is hard to do these days. <laughs> but but um, that said, you know, what are your hopes? You know, I mean, obviously you've been a change agent, um, you know, whether people agree with it or not, you know, you've done you in your way and continue to do so. And I think like that's tremendous what do you hope, what are your hopes in terms of um, how you can continue to change even just the world of ballet? Mm -hmm. You know, all I can do is, is continue to um, push this conversation mm -hmm. and, and in a, in a broad way, you know, that it's not just the conversation that we're having between us, people who look like us, but that we're pushing, uh, you know, for the ballet community to step outside of their comfort zone and to feel uncomfortable and to make real true progress and change. And, and mm -hmm. I must say that in my 20 plus years as a professional in the past two or three years, it's the most progress I've, I've seen, which is, makes me so hopeful. Um, you know, but but for me personally, I feel like I've really done my part and what I can do while being a part of these institutions. You know, it's, American Ballet Theater is is a white institution in the in the classical ballet world, and I feel like I'm at a place, you know, with 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 you know my own foundation, with with founding my own foundation, the Misty Copeland Foundation, and starting our first program, the Be Bold program, which stands for Ballet Explorations. Ballet offers leadership development, and being able to implement a free after-school ballet class in communities that don't have the opportunity or the access. Mm -hmm. um, so our first our first program is uh, being implemented in five boys and girls club sites in the Bronx. Um, we're, we're starting small, but we, you know we're we're trying to do it right and have it. Grow Grow. And it's and it's not, you know, just about bringing ballet to these communities so that they can uh, go on to become the next Raven Wilkinson or Misty Copeland, but it's to give them the tools to be leaders in their communities. It's mm. to show them that they can be a part of this craft this art form, whether that is on the stage or behind the scenes or eventually joining a board of directors, making real progress in within these institutions, starting them young, um, giving them the skills and the tools to go on to be great at whatever it is they want to do. And, but I think this is the importance of art. And if we can't get that in public schools, um, like I wish we could in every public school, then creating uh, yeah. opportunities in the after school space, um, to me, that's the next step in my in my uh, career and my impact on the ballet world. 
Um, I love that. I mean, as as a arts kid myself, I love that. I mean, I, and listen, we know it's hard to get even history taught properly in schools these right. days. So, you know, you are right. We are having to look for alternative ways to do that. Um, I do want to talk just a little more about uh, the personal aspect that you wove into this particular uh, offering. Uh, we're going to do that in two seconds as soon as we come back with more Writing Black. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything black. Listen today on the Griot mobile app for all the black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. So, Misty, this is so interesting to me because I I think you are understandably and admirably a private person. <laughs> and you have <laughs> you have been the entire time I've been watching your career. Um, but in this memoir, this 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 particular chapter of your ongoing uh, story, you give us a glimpse at not just the mechanics of your career and the personal aspects of your life that I guess, you know, you know, your childhood and how that informed your career, but you also give us a glimpse at your love story, which is really uh, <laughs> new for us, <laughs> you know, <laughs> people who have watched that, yeah. you know, who people who, have, who, who, you know, maybe knew, you know, knew you had a significant other, knew you got married, knew yeah. more recently that you are uh, now the parents of a son. Um yeah. <laughs> you weave that in here and it's so lovely and it's so beautiful and it's so uh <laughs> touching and personal and um but uh, was that challenging for you because I, I i feel like you've been really good at being like <laughs> and that's yeah. over here. <laughs> you know, i i feel like you know there's for me uh, there's like a time and place for it mm -hmm. and this book is so personal to yeah. me and and also my love story with my husband, Olu, Raven was such a big part of it. Mm. And so I felt it necessary to really show. She um, was a fan for sure. She was <laughs> man. <laughs> she would flirt with Olu in front of me. Like she loved that man. They danced together at our wedding. Um, it, it, again, I wanted to be able to show and, you know, Raven and so many, I feel like so many black women of her generation were this way, you know, kind of kept their private lives private. Mm -hmm. um, and Raven was that way. And I wanted to be able to give people an opportunity to see all sides of her, you know, mm -hmm. not just the ballerina on the stage, but who she was as a person and the impact that she had behind the scenes, the way that I handled, you know, having conversations with my artistic director or, um, you know, Olu and I coming together in a real way. Like Raven was a big part of that. And I just wanted to show the impact that she had on me and on my husband and, um, and that, you know, that she will have on my son, you know, the mm -hmm. more that we share about her. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just feel like she was a big part of my life and it was important to tell that part of our story. Raven taught me through her example that as they say, when and where I enter, the whole race enters with me is not just a burden and a pressure, but it offers the promise of possibility. Well, I loved it. I thought it was really Thank sweet. <laughs> is there anybody that you love that you read? This is, you know, just, to, just as we ask this of everybody before they go, like, is there anybody you love to read that we should know about? Yeah. Well, ta -Nehisi Coates. Yes. I mean, yes, he's, I mean, just... I, I don't understand how someone can be so good with words and just have such an such a an understanding of uh, just kind of connecting the dots and mm -hmm. and um, I thought about him a lot when I was you know writing writing the beginning of this book mm -hmm. and and what it is to raise a black son um, and yeah I mean I've never met him he's someone that I would love to 
meet and have a conversation with. <laughs> well, I, I have a feeling that's probably not too far off. And I, and I also know for a fact that people feel the same way about you and your <laughs> dancing as they do about Tanahasi and his words. So there you go. Genius meets genius. Misty Copeland, thank you so much for thank gracing us here on Writing Black with your presence. And with this latest book, again, you know, if y'all have been sleeping on Misty Copeland books, like there's lots of them out there for you. The holidays are coming. This is a great book to gift. Also, your children's books are great. So, you know, um, I think I think uh, people are going to be I, I assume people are going to be hearing more from you in this. You know, this is yet another chapter. And I'm just so happy that you shared it with us. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. We will be back in a minute with more Writing Black. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot Mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. All right, let's get back into it. Welcome back to Writing Black. I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed that conversation with Misty Copeland. And, you know, she was just telling us about who she loves to read. But this is a little segment that we call My Favorites, uh, where I tell you who I would recommend based on the conversation that we just had. You know, um, what's so special about When at My Back is uh, Misty's you know, personal and professional mentorship from Raven Wilkinson, this um, until now unsung black ballerina who I hope everyone will get to know um, through this story and others. Um, but the overriding message that I took home was that of, of mentorship and what it means to um, get that kind of empathy and guidance and, and just, you know, understanding from um, whether it be from a peer or uh, a, 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 an elder, I, I think that those relationships are so valuable. So another book that I would recommend would be Miss Chloe. Uh, this is a memoir of a literary friendship with the one and only Toni Morrison, written by A.J. Verdell. Um, some of you might not know that Toni Morrison's birth name <laughs> was actually Chloe. So Miss Chloe is a story of... Um, her friendship with AJ and and really giving you a glimpse at this incredible, incredible storyteller and woman and figure and, you know, all of all of the texture and complexities um, of her that also fed into the writing that we all still love so much. Um, so check that out. We will be here next time with more Writing Black. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode of Writing Black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard.